Thanks for joining us this uh, lesson, which has to deal with the War of 1812, America's second war for independence. Um, James Madison, who had served as Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson, uh, had won election uh, to the presidency in 1808, and he will win re-election in 1812 over DeWitt Clinton of New York. And therefore, Madison becomes the fourth president, uh, this time also following Jefferson's footsteps as part of the Republican Party. He did have a tough time implementing his presidential powers, as his modesty and humility kind of made him appear weak. Now, um, whereas Jefferson had steered a path of neutrality when it came to dealing with France and Britain, things had progressed uh, to where eventually the Warhawks will get Madison to uh, kind of push for war, and eventually Congress will declare war in what becomes known as Mr. Madison's War. Now you see some of these Warhawks, like Henry Clay from Kentucky on the left and John C. Calhoun from South Carolina on the right, uh, started you know, kind of pushing for war. Uh, they were upset that our maritime rights were being taken away, especially in the Caribbean. You know, whether it was the impressment of our sailors, the confiscation of our ships, you know, the fact that our honor and pride uh, were being kind of taken away from us. They wanted to defend um, our integrity and kind of stand up to the British and French. And uh, therefore, um, they kind of uh, even looked to Canada uh, as kind of being a, perhaps, you know, kind of a spoil of war. That if we're able to defeat the British, uh, we could actually claim Canada as part of the United States. Others, including Madison, simply looked at Canada as kind of being a means to the end. Uh, once war is declared in 1812, Madison believed that the key was, uh, the, the key to victory lay in Canada. Um, and we were going to invade there, even though it was going to be very tough. But he believed Canada was important because um, the food that was harvested there was what kind of fed the Caribbean islands of the British Empire. And so if we could defeat Canada, we could put the pressure on them to try to end the war quickly. Uh, and so we're going to see you know, battles rage in Canada along the Great Lakes. Uh, we also see the fact that the British put up a naval blockade along the eastern coast of the United States. However, not uh, involving New England at first, uh, because New England was kind of anti-war and, and was still trading with the British. But as time goes on, eventually they're blockaded as well. We also see fighting in the Chesapeake region. Um, and they even uh, kind of uh, occupy, the British do occupy Washington and burn it down. Um, and it's really kind of just symbolic only. Uh, but then we'll also take a look briefly uh, at the key port of New Orleans down in the Gulf of Mexico. But at the same time that we're worrying about the British, we're also worrying about the uh, Native Americans out west, as Tecumseh was trying to unite Native American tribes against white settlement and encroachment upon their lands. And their attacks upon the U.S. we thought were being provoked um, by the British. And so we had several different issues that we had to worry about during this time. And as it turned out, uh, there was very little success early on as a military and a government that was cut in size uh, by Thomas Jefferson was no match for the you know, largest and most well-trained army in the world. Um, and in fact, early on in 1812, um, Major General William Hull had to surrender his entire army uh, at, and, at, to British forces at Detroit. And also we had very little success in Niagara and Montreal. And even when our government you know, petitioned for loans and money and support, very little, like I said, came from New England at first. Um, and that's why the British kind of left them open, because they kind of continued the illegal trade uh, with Great Britain. However, the United States naval forces have uh, more success, especially on the Great Lakes here, early on because the British fleet uh, was still uh, back at England defending them uh, because of the Napoleonic Wars. And being that we believed whoever controlled the Great Lakes controlled the West, we did look to try to advance our cause here. And in September of 1813, Oliver Perry is able to destroy the British fleet on Lake, uh, Lake Erie, and where he kind of says his famous quote of, We have met the enemy, and he is ours. And later, uh, the next month also, uh, in 1813, uh, General Harrison is able to overrun British troops 
and uh, the Native American Tecumseh is even killed at the Battle of Thames. So we do see that there is some success here, even though it does show that this is going to be a long, difficult war against the British. And after defeating Napoleon Bonaparte in 1814, the British kind of redo their military plan here and go on the offensive. And they'll kind of concentrate on the Canadian front in the Chesapeake region and down in New Orleans. It's at this time that Washington, D.C. is uh, captured and burnt down, which is more symbolic than it is uh, you know, strategic. Um, it's also the same, time, same year uh, where Baltimore is attacked and Fort McHenry, after a, a heavy bombardment of it, is left you know, kind of standing. And it's after this battle where Francis Scott Key writes his famous Star Spangled Banner. However, uh, during the late 1814 into early 1815, because many New Englanders had kind of opposed this war uh, and had even carried on that illegal uh, lucrative trade, as I have mentioned, um, some New Englanders meet in, in Hartford, Connecticut, to discuss ways to try to uh, change the way that the government uh, is empowered. Uh, one of the things they want to do away with is the three-fifths compromise because many of these New Englanders fear that because of that, it gives southern states uh, an advantage in the electoral college and makes it more likely that southern presidents will be elected. Um, they also want to put a one-year term on presidents uh, because many of the uh, presidents had come from Virginia uh, early on, and they want to try to limit the strength of those southern states once again. But they also then wanted a two-thirds vote in Congress for war um, because they were so opposed to this war and didn't want to fight it. They want to make it tougher to fight future wars. Now, some of these ideas are pretty radical, um, and actually some people kind of said that the Hartford Convention had gone too far and you know, kind of were threatening secession, which isn't true. Uh, but it kind of gives the idea of the divide in the support for the war effort. And that convention is kind of overshadowed as well because uh, in that same month, 1814, the Treaty of Ghent is signed, uh, which does little more than end hostilities between the United States and the British, but at least it does bring an end to the war. Or at least we think it does. Because back in the day, since messages and news kind of traveled so slowly, um, the British never got word that the treaty had been signed. And on January 8, 1815, um, the British launched an attack at New Orleans on a very well-defended position, uh, defended by Andrew Jackson. And because of his strong defensive stand, um, Jackson is able to defeat the British and rise to great prominence and fame and become a great uh, general, um, and eventually that will help compel him up uh, to win the presidency. Uh, but this battle takes place after the war was officially over. And lastly here, a couple things we'll be discussing uh, in class will deal with Native American conflicts during this time, uh, John Marshall and his Supreme Court, and the ordeal with involving Aaron Burr.